Hunter, have you ever experienced a solar eclipse? A solar and when eclipse. was it and how did you feel? How did you feel about it? Uh, so I think it was 2017 that there was this solar eclipse that most of the United States could experience in some way. And I know a lot yes, of people is traveled to get into the the path of highest view, or I'm not sure what the technical term is. <laughs> uh, and Totality that wasn't that far from term. here. Like if I had driven a couple hours, I think I could have made it or something. But I experienced it here in Portland. Um, and it was maybe not as dramatic as what other people experienced, but it was still very interesting, the sort of bands of light that came up. Uh, it was, um, yeah, it felt... It felt significant for some reason. It felt different. I can understand why people are seeking these out and travel around to uh, to experience them at the sort of most ideal locations. Um, I will say, on a side note, that I did take an astronomy class in college. Ooh, all right. <laughs> What'd it, you learn? <laughs> well, a lot of what I learned, I don't remember, unfortunately. You know, I know this is probably not the greatest thing for an instructor to say. <laughs> Um, but you know, I wasn't like a hard, like a physical science kind of guy. I was more on the social science and humanity side of things. Um, but the the teacher was a very interesting guy. He had been there for a really long time, and um, he would a couple times he brought his guitar into class, and <laughs> uh, he would sing these songs uh, about astronomy, but to to songs that a lot of people knew. So, for example, um, he had a version of an astronomy song that he, he wrote to, um, house of the rising sun. Okay. Do you know that song? I am not, I'm not sure if I can even tell song. you any lyrics from a copyright standpoint. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's, let's not this that. is just a little bit before your time maybe. But the amazing thing was that some people started singing along cause he handed out the lyrics and then people who had been there in years past, some people came back to listen to this and to participate in this. So, you know, it wasn't anybody rolling their eyes. People were sort of into it. Um, and I thought that was a great teaching moment. Um, and I guess I remember that more than anything. Uh, anyways, <laughs> what about you? Have you experienced a solar eclipse? I experienced the only solar experience, only, only solar eclipse experience I have is the same one that you had Hunter, which was the 2017 solar eclipse that made first landfall here in Oregon and would sort of stretch all the way across the other side of the, the country. And we're going to talk all about the 20, 2017 solar eclipse a little bit later. I don't want to dive too deeply into it, but right, right. I also, uh, I, I, unfortunately I had to work that day. I, I worked in downtown Portland and there's an image of, you know, all of us standing on like a balcony and we're all sort of looking up with our things, but it was not, Portland wasn't not, was not in the path of totality. Right. And that's so a key word right there yeah. because Apparently, to be in the path of totality is, well, it's pretty dang important. Apparently. Yeah. I haven't experienced yeah. it, but it's like one of those things where it's like, well, you didn't even really experience it then. I'm sure listeners uh, <laughs> who've been in, in that area and that swath are thinking, you, you, you haven't experienced anything. Exactly. But let's go ahead and start talking all about solar eclipses today. Today is the geography of solar eclipses for the obvious reason that, well, as we're recording this, Hunter, there's a solar eclipse barreling down onto North America, and that will basically begin over the Pacific Ocean uh, before going through northern Mexico, through the United States, including the major cities of San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, Indianapolis, Cleveland, Buffalo, and Rochester, and then into Canada, where I'll cross over Montreal. Uh, and this is this is the path of totality. Obviously, there will be partial partialness basically all over the, the continent. I feel like I should take it to Montreal or, or, or Cleveland, perhaps. Yeah. You would not be the only one. Yeah. So, and we're going okay, okay, to get to that. Okay, okay, good. We're going to talk all about that. Okay. Because it's it's a lot right now. <laughs> um, there, so, like I said, there's one barreling down. At, you know, at the time of, that we're recording, it's about four days away, right? It'll happen right. on April 8th. We are recording here on April 4th. By the time that you're listening to this listener, it will have happened yesterday. So, this will be kind of... Hopefully you got a really cool experience out of it. And now you're all interested in solar eclipses. And we have a really fun episode all about that for you to digest. <laughs> kind of we're time traveling. That's kind of our hope here. Like, like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. A lot of, like I mentioned, a lot of other places will experience the solar eclipse in some fashion, including those of us here in Portland. Although the degree to which we will experience it will, well, for one, for our for those of us here in Portland, it'll depend on the cloud cover, right? right? I think it's actually supposed to be a cloudy day on Monday, so we might not get any of it. 
but it'd also be various degrees of like a sliver. You know, you can sort of see the moon over it. Obviously, uh, don't look at the sun during this time unless you have the proper glasses. Please, please, please don't do that. You right. will cause damage to your eyes. Yeah. You will. <laughs> Even if you're in the path of totality, I feel like I shouldn't have to say this, but if you, and, you know, it fully covers the sun, do not look at that time because it will da damage your eyes. So we're hoping <laughs> Just by will. the time this airs that people have not looked directly at the sun. Not unless they have one of those fancy glasses. No. Right. Do you have those glasses? <laughs> you got one of those Hank kicking around? I did in 2017. Yeah, but so I didn't did I? I don't, for, I, yeah, seven years. Around. It's like you're going to a 3D movie or something kind of was the experience, yeah. But really why we're talking about solar eclipses today is because there is a, and we've already sort of alluded to this, there's a fascinating modern geography attached to it as well as a really interesting sort of ancient geography and in historic geography that gets attached to each of these events because well as you can imagine these are this is a massive sort of ast astronomic event that um, if you can sort of transport yourself back to let's say 500 BCE what happens above you you're probably going to assume that something is happening <laughs> right. like something big like and you're going to you're Unless there was a like oral tradition of talking about it, you're outside right. one day and um, the sun gets eclipsed. That, that could be I mean, inspiring or disturbing or maybe a little bit of both. I don't know. A little bit of both. Yeah, something. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about some of those, those, those things. In fact, today's episode is largely going to be kind of a series of stories, you know, as we go through sort of different historic eclipses and sort of what they did and more might have impacted various things. It should be kind of a fun episode, a little bit different from what we're used to, but I think I'm, I think it'll be a fun episode. Well, I mean, Griffey before, is references the earth and we're talking about the right. earth in the sense we're experiencing it from earth, but we're also getting a little bit cosmic here, which I think is cool. Exactly. Yeah, and we, we always say that we're going to have a geography as the moon episode. And so this is sort of also in that same realm. It's, you know, it's a little right. bit cosmic, but it right. has an impact here. And that's sort of what we're going to talk about. Uh, but first, let's let's talk about what what a solar eclipse is. Hunter, do you know what a solar eclipse is? Walk us through, if you know. Uh, all right. So this is where I'm feeling the pressure of having taken the astronomy class and not really remembering much. Um, but it's, you, you, you led in with that. So I know, I know <laughs> You're I now our probably <laughs> held that story back until the end of the episode. Uh, it's when the moon blocks the sun. Is that what's going on? Basically. All right. I mean, that so, is, yeah, to, to, I guess you're not going to, to figure basically. that out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but the, as with most things, it, it gets a little bit more advanced than that. So let's sort of dive into, dive into it. I think the first thing to note here, Hunter, is that there are, there's not just sort of one type of eclipse. There's there's multiple types of eclipses. For one, there's a solar eclipse and a lunar eclipse. And this is, episode is largely about solar eclipses, which we're going to mostly focus in on, aside from one key story that I thought was really fun and I really wanted to include it. Okay. But there are, are also different types of solar eclipses. So there are broadly four types of solar eclipses. There is a total solar eclipse, and this would be when the dark silhouette of the moon completely obscures the sort of the light, the bright light of the sun, allowing the much fainter solar corona to be visible. And that's a key word, the solar corona. Okay. We're going to talk a little bit about that in a little bit as well. After that, there's the annular solar eclipse, when the sun and moon are exactly in line with the Earth, but the apparent size of the moon is smaller than that of the sun. And so the total is where sort of the moon is perfectly the same size as the sun, and you get this really cool effect called the solar corona. And annular is when there's a little bit more of a distance between the sun, moon, and earth. And therefore, the earth or the moon looks smaller. And so you can still kind of see the sun behind it's it. sort of a halo so effect these, or something going on. Potentially, yeah. You're going yeah. to see more of the sun sort of surrounded the bright light, everything like that. And you will not see the corona during an annular. Okay. Then there's a partial partial eclipse, which is exactly what it sounds like. So when the sun and moon are not exactly in line with the earth and, and the moon only partially obscures the sun. So again, there's going to be a, for, for April 8th solar eclipse, there's going to be a long string of total solar eclipses and then a much wider area that basically encompasses the entire uh, North American continent that will see the partial eclipse. I see. So it's, it depends where you are. I mean, that's the geography. That's part of the geography of it. It's, it's, what could be a, uh, you know, a total eclipse for right. one person is going to end up being a uh, a partial eclipse for somebody else. 
Exactly. Right. This is this is the hard geography, right, of of an of a solar eclipse, right? There's there's places that are going to be directly in line with a very tight band. And then and that's going to be that's going to have impacts. It's going to have ge- geographic impacts. And we're going to talk about that sort of the, that's going to be like sort of the end of our episode today. Is we're going to talk about what some of those impacts actually are, especially in the modern day context. And then our last one is a hybrid eclipse, which is also called an annular slash total eclipse. And it's sort of a an eclipse where the there's a sort of a shifts it shifts between the two of these um, at any given time. And so I'm not exactly sure how that happens. You know, maybe it's just <clears throat> at a point when the moon is already drifting into an area that it is naturally farther away. So maybe it starts as a total and then just literally during those few hours it sort of drifts into sort of a an annular so it becomes visibly it becomes smaller i'm not exactly sure mostly what we're talking about in this episode is going to be total solar eclipses okay and mo- that's mostly because you know especially in recent times the media has kind of whipped itself into a frenzy every time one of these happens right particularly in in areas that are more easily accessible for, well, certainly for those of us here in the United States, easily accessible for people in the United States or Canada, you know, just so that people can, can, can visit. And total solar eclipses are unique in because of the way in which the moon covers the sun, which allows that corona to be viewed. Now, apparently, to people who really love solar eclipses, to see anything other than the corona means that you have not really experienced a solar eclipse. I haven't, I haven't experienced quote unquote totality. So I can't, I'm not a convert. Right, <laughs> um, yeah. The purists, they, they have a different idea of this. Yeah. But, but the purists have an idea of like, you know, this is, this is, this is something that you need to experience. This is not, this, you're not going to get the full effect. You can get 99.9% of the way there and it's not, the same as totality. I'm getting a little FOMO kind of vibe right now. <laughs> I'm feeling a little jealous, but that's all right. I know, right? I, you know, I've seen a, I've seen an image of it. A, that is also not the the total. That's not. That's not. That doesn't get you there. I guess. Right. It does look kind of cool. The photo looks kind of cool. I don't know. I, I would say that. You know, I'll try and get to the next solar eclipse, but we're going to talk about why that's probably not going to be the case in a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could see where this would um, be a spiritual experience, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Now, the other thing I want to sort of touch on here is that I think there's this idea that people have that solar eclipses are a rare phenomenon. They don't happen very often. Um and that, you know, if you don't see one now, you're not going to see one for another 50 years or something like right. that. But this is only kind of true. Okay. So the reality is that for total solar eclipses, so there's a path of totality, you can see the corona, et cetera. This occurs somewhere on Earth every 18 months on average. Oh, wow. That's, so that feels almost frequent. It's it's. it's very frequent, right? It's coming at a, a pretty regular cadence. But the reason why they feel so rare is because they only reoccur at any given place once every 360 to 410 years. I see. And so they kind of happen everywhere. And a lot of times they happen over the ocean because the ocean is so it's pretty dang big. large. Yeah, there's a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of water. Yeah, exactly. And so the, the solar eclipse that's happening this upcoming week or t- yesterday, I guess, as you're listening, won't happen in roughly the same spot until sometime in the late 2300s, probably. Wow. They haven't mathed that it out that far. They have mathed out all of the 2100s, though. This is only increasing my FOMO. Like, I'm just it's really <laughs> right. getting amped up right now. Um, so during the 21st century, the century that we're living in right now, there will be 224 solar eclipses, of which 77 will be partial, 72 will be annular, 68 will be total, and seven will be that hybrid between total and annular eclipses. So the hybrid are definitely the rarest of the bunch. And because astrophysics has gotten pretty advanced, apparently we can figure all of this out well ahead of time. <laughs> it's amazing. I don't know how. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think I'm not, there, I'm not, I'm not here to ask questions. <laughs> there are ancient civilizations that had a handle on this, I think, as well, because they had some pretty advanced knowledge of astronomy. Um, but yeah, I don't possess that knowledge myself. 
Yeah, I think I think, for example, the Mayans had some pretty advanced. I don't know if they ever predicted solar eclipses, but they definitely had a really advanced calendar and they could sort of plot various things well ahead of time. I wouldn't be surprised if the Mayan civilization, you know, had a lot of these sort of already identified. Um, Certainly, you know, and we're going to talk a little bit about this. But certainly, you know, in terms of sort of the modern age of sort of scientific discovery, European astronomers were starting to figure this out kind of around the Renaissance period, 1400s, 1500s. Right. right. Yeah. I also want to highlight before we move on here to the the cosmic coincidence of, of all of this that's happening, because it's really quite fascinating, right? And do and you know what I'm talking about, Hunter? Um, I, I don't think I'm, I'm getting what you're putting down here. You're going to have to spell it out for me. That's, that's fine. So we, we, as we look up to the sky, there's the sun and the moon that we can kind of see. And these two are vastly different in actual size, right? The moon is very much smaller than the sun, right? But it's close. However, but it's much closer, right? Yeah. And so this gives the appearance that as you're looking up to the sky, they're both roughly the same size. And the actual cosmic coincidence is that the sun is 400 times the diameter of the moon while also sitting about 400 times further from the Earth. See, I didn't know so about the two. Ap- yeah. yeah. So the two appear to be the, the, the same size in the sky. And this means that when the, this is what gives, this is what allows us to have a total a solar eclipse, right? The moon can sh- sit in front of the 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 sun and feel like it totally blocks it out and gives us that corona. This is something that if the moon were a little bit smaller, and according actually there's a book called Totality by Mark Littman um, that if the moon was just 273 kilometers smaller in diameter, that's not a lot for, you know, these sort of for, massive for celestial yeah. objects. Or if it were just a little further away, People would never see a total solar that eclipse. Is, that is right. It's this huge cosmic coincidence. And yeah. of course, because the moon is slowly drifting away from the earth, there's a point where total solar eclipses will no longer be possible. I don't know exactly when that is, but I think it might. Probably, some, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think it'll take a little while. <laughs> I think we're safe. <laughs> I don't think anybody here needs to necessarily rush to, well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's go ahead and dive into some ancient history. And we'll start with just sort of first story, and then maybe we'll take a quick break um, because we're already getting getting to our point here. But obviously, eclipses have played a large role in many events throughout history. The reality, though, is that we're not ever really going to know how each individual solar eclipse impacted each civilization. That's just how history goes. We make that caveat all the time. We don't know. Even what we're going to talk about today, we don't really know how it played out. This is like you know, kind of a game of, you know, historic telephone a little bit as, you know, places are <laughs> telling stories that aren't even their own and sort of gets passed down. That said, the oldest recorded solar eclipse that was recorded on a clay tablet was found at Ugarit in modern Syria uh, with two plausible dates that are usually cited. And this is from scientists that have tried to dive in into this a little bit. It is either May 3rd, 1375 BCE, or March 5th, 1223 BCE. And so this is sort of the first time that somebody has ever sort of recorded that one of these things happened. That's sort of a widespread, and I think it just sort of illustrates the way in which we're not able to truly pinpoint when one of these events happen. However, it's also kind of a pr- precise, right? We have like specific dates. Yeah, like and that's because specific dates. <laughs> is it in between those dates or those are the two dates? Those are the two dates because they can actually go back and track using sort of math when when solar eclipses were happening in the past, right? And so they've been able to date, because there's obviously not a, a Gregorian date on this, the calendar date on this this tablet, but what they've been able to do is say, okay, this tablet is from around this era, so it's likely one of these two solar eclipses that that we can math out that did happen in the past. So right? everything so kind before of, that, there were eclipses, but it's kind of lost to history because nobody wrote about it. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, there were eclipses, but yeah, exactly. And, you know, somebody did write about this one, but again, it's like, okay, well, when, what era is this clay tablet from? And let's assign it to right. that event. And so they, that's how they sort of got down to this, is a very wide, you know, date spread, but also they're like, it's either May 3rd or it's March 5th. You know, it's right. like very precise and not precise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, m- moving on, the legendary Chinese king, Zhang Kong, supposedly beheaded two astronomers 
who failed to predict an eclipse around 4,000 years ago. But that's kind of impressive that they were even trying to predict them 4,000 yeah, years ago. Seems outrageous, but yeah. Again, this is more legendary territory. Right. Perhaps the earliest still unproven claim is that of archaeologist Bruce Mass, who putatively links an eclipse that occurred around May 10th, 2807 BCE with a possible meteor impact in the Indian Ocean on the basis of several ancient flood myths that mention a total solar eclipse. So that could potentially be the oldest, but it's not really proven. Um, and so people are still like, eh. so, so just going back the, the 1375 or 1223 BCE are the only ones that are sort of proven to have been documented and recorded and, 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 you know, X, Y, Z. The ancient Greek historian Herodotus, who is a very well-known historian, I think he's maybe credited as the first kind of like quote unquote modern, you know, historian, somebody who's actually actively writing down what was happening. He wrote that the, the, Thale of Miletus predicted an eclipse that occurred during a battle between Medes and the Lydians. Apparently, when this happened, both sides put down their weapons and declared peace as a result of the eclipse. This exact eclipse involved, the exact eclipse involved kind of remains uncertain. They don't know which one it might have been. Although the issue has been studied by a bunch of different historians and scholars throughout times, one likely candidate would be the May 28th, 585 BCE eclipse that, that pro occurred probably near the Halys River in Asia Minor, sort of that Southwest Asia sort of area. All that's to say, you know, there's definitely, you know, some tales that are starting to filter through of like, okay, here's an solar eclipse that happened, and it kind of created peace for between two warring countries. So that's Kind of an interesting sort of story. And so this <laughs> is this happened, or we think this may have happened, or how 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 how. I mean, Herodotus is this? what's that? Herodotus. I mean, he wrote and, and and wrote down a lot of different things that have been proven to be correct. Okay. I'm not sure if everything he's ever written was has been proven. That doesn't mean it hasn't happened. Right. But I would say this is probably one of the most. I would say of of the stories that we've sort of gone through already, you know, the legendary Chinese king. I'd say this one's probably falling on the more likely side to have actually happened. Um, whether it did or it didn't, I, I can't say for certain. And nobody can. That's we just, should just that's do just that history. as a planet. Just sort of keep that tradition going where whenever there's <laughs> right. an eclipse, people should maybe stop fighting. Uh, I mean, it shouldn't take right. an eclipse, but you know, if any excuse we can have would be good, I feel like. Um, let's go ahead and take our first ad break because we're mm. already getting a little bit over time here. And then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about some of the more modern stories because there's, there's a few of those that I think are really fun as well. And so we will be right back. And we're back. We are talking about the geography of solar eclipses. We just ran through a bunch of ancient history. Well, some ancient history, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, and now we're going to sort of dive into some more stories that are sort of more about the, I would say, more modern solar eclipses that have maybe had an impact here or there. Again, these are like, these are single events that sort of don't take place all that often. And they don't take place in areas that are having a historic moment all that often. And so therefore... There's sort of more like individual stories rather than you know, a lot of like wide ranging impacts, but that's okay. That's that's what this episode's about. It's the history and geography once again brought together in a very interesting way. I love it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So we're going to get to sort of the more modern, the 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 solar eclipse that happened in 2017, the one that's happening this week. But first, let's go back to the quote unquote age of discovery, which is an age that, you know, when the Europeans felt like they were discovering the world everywhere and sort of renaming everything themselves. And I kind of want to go back to not a solar eclipse, but I want to talk about a lunar eclipse for a second, okay. because I think it highlights some, some things that the Europeans were able to leverage against sort of the people that they were trying to colonize. And so let's go back to March 1504. Uh, this was Shortly after, sort of relatively shortly after Columbus's first voyage in 1492, apparently on June 30th, 1503, Christopher Columbus beached his last two caravels, caravels is a type of ship, and got stranded on the island that we now call Jamaica, sort of in that Caribbean area. 
The indigenous people of the island initially welcomed Christopher Columbus and his crew and fed them, but after six months, they kind of halted the food supply uh, because they were dissatisfied with what the Spaniards could provide in terms of trade or, or help or anything like that. And obviously, there's probably some other stuff going on that we're not privy to because all of our records are coming from Christopher Columbus himself. Right. So and we're, we're getting, only getting, we're the, getting story. the full story here. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of coming off as like the indigenous peoples are being mean and they're not sharing any of their food, but it's probably something else. Probably we're being really else. honest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, however, what Christopher Columbus was able to do, apparently on on board that he brought with him, you know, on a ship, he brought an almanac authored authored by Abraham Zacuto of it's an almanac of astronomic tables covering the years 1475 to 1506. Remember, it's about 1503 right now. And so he was able to use, actually it might be 1504 now, he, he actually used this almanac's knowledge of an upcoming lunar eclipse in 1504 to intimidate local people in Jamaica into providing his crew with food, showcasing sort of the power of, the have, of, of these sort of astronomical events and sort of the knowledge of these events and being able to use them to your advantage. And so it's kind of interesting to think of, well, if one, this lunar eclipse wasn't going to happen at this period of time, what you know, would or should or, or not what would or could Columbus have done to potentially feed his people. And it's also the the power of having that knowledge on hand to be able to, you know, influence people who necessarily didn't really think about things in the same way. So it's just kind of like a really good example of that. And I really loved it. And that's why I wanted yeah, to include it. World view coming together and um, yeah, using knowledge to exploit a situation. Go figure. Yeah. Right. And so this was a story that, one, it was about a lunar eclipse, but the reason why I wanted to talk about this story is because it provides a, a pretty good contrast to a story we're going to talk about next. So this this Columbus story was all about sort of Christopher Columbus and sort of the how, how he as a colonizer was basically able to dupe a bunch of indigenous peoples into sort of getting his way. This next story is about a solar eclipse, and it's sort of the opposite. It's about a, it's about the indigenous peoples being able to use a solar eclipse and predict it in order to gain an upper hand over their colonizers. So let's dive into that. So we're going to jump ahead a few hundred years to okay. 1806, June 16th, 1806 solar eclipse. And it's been, it's been called Tecumseh's eclipse after the Shawnee chief Tecumseh. And so Tecumseh realized that the only hope during this time, this was a period of time when the United States was pushing to the West as far and as fast as possible. There was this idea of manifest destiny. Hunter, what was manifest destiny? It's the belief that um, Europeans and early European Americans had that they had, a, there was a destiny for, for them to take over the continent basically and to move West and take it over. Exactly. Right. There was this inherent sort of ideology that within within sort of the the white settlers the european settlers that this was our land and we're just going to keep pushing and it, it's all it all belongs to us anyway so we're just going to keep going until we reach the basically the other the other side of it and so this was happening during this time and so tecumseh realized that the only hope that he that the shawnee or any tribes would have would be if they joined together to to mount some sort of you know, bigger sort of defense, some sort of you know, united front. And so according to, to sort of the, the stories at the time, he was assisted by his brother, Tensqu Tensquantana. Tens I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm mispronouncing this, but that's, that's fine. I actually tried to look this up and there wasn't a pronunciation for this person's name. But he was called the prophet who called for a rejection of European influence and return to traditional values. And so this tribal unity, this, this thing that Tecumseh was trying to bring together, uh, really posed a, a kind of a big threat to the United States. Um, and so and, and in particular, a, a particular person, his name was William Henry Harrison, who was the territorial governor of Indiana and the future ninth president of the United States. And so Harrison tried to discredit the Shawnee, and and sort of the the prophet and sort of he challenged him to sort of prove his powers this this prophet and so he wrote apparently if he talking about the prophet is really a prophet ask him to cause the sun to stand still or the moon to alter its course the rivers to cease to flow or the dead to rise from their graves right basically saying like if you really believe that this person is all powerful that he is this prophet and you are uniting under him uh, and his brother Tecumseh 
prove it. Prove that you have this power. Let's see a miracle, basically. Yeah. Let's see a miracle, basically. And so the prophets declared that the great spirit was angry at Harrison and would give a sign. And so, quote, 50 days from this day, there will be no cloud in the sky. Yet when the sun has reached its highest point, at that moment, will the great spirit take it into her hand and hide it from us. The darkness of night will thereupon cover us and the stars will shine around us. The, the stars will shine round about us. The birds will roost and the night creatures will awaken and stir. And on that day, as it should, should happen, there was a solar eclipse. And Harrison's attempt to divide the Shawnee people backfired spectacular as they basically saw that as a sign to unite. Um, and so it's kind of theorized that had this not happened, that the various tribes inside the region. And, and there was a lot of, you know, resistance around this, this area from these tribes that they would have fallen much faster. And so that's a really fascinating story. Now, again, this is not that long ago. So we do have some historical records that's, that show that some of this actually happened, but it's also still a long time ago. And, you know, who's to say exactly how much of this is totally accurate, whether these were the exact words that were muttered right. where, you know, what's fabricated or what's sort of exaggerated. We don't exactly know. However, I would say that there's a pretty clear idea that one, the Shawnee had some knowledge that a solar eclipse was going to happen in some capacity. Um, I'm not exactly sure what it was. Maybe they had their own mathematician, astrologers, you know, very, very likely. But they were able to pinpoint or, it like point on from, you know. They, but they, yeah, I mean that yeah. it's it's kind of what right? knowledge. It's kind yeah, of, <laughs> they had the knowledge. <laughs> yeah. And then it, it it's it's just it's just a it's a really interesting story of the sort of the opposite end of these people who are being colonized to be able to use something like this as such like a binding force against against an an, an enemy that is actively trying to to drive you away. So I thought that was a really fun story. <laughs> yeah, that's I've I've not heard I've not heard most of these stories um, and they, they seem like fictional, but, and of course we don't know exactly, but there's probably some truth to them. Uh, it's amazing. And we've said this before uh, on the podcast, but you know, this happened just over 200 years ago, which in human right. history is pretty recent, uh, but mm -hmm. we still don't know all the details of it. And it's, it's amazing how quickly, events sort of get lost to history or, you know, uh, right. we can pinpoint some things, but other things we just have to sort of take our best guess. Yeah. And this, again, this is not, this is during this time, this early 1800s period, this is not beyond the period of time when they could, when, when people were mathing this stuff out, they, there were people around the world who knew this was going to happen, whether it was wide, widely known, you know, that that's right. maybe up for debate. So it could have been that, you know, somebody who's, you know, part of the Shawnee tribe sort of knew, had that knowledge beforehand, knew that this was going to happen. And that the, 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 the governor, the Indiana governor simply didn't. And maybe it came out afterwards that they're like, well, yeah, we knew this was going to happen anyways, but the impact was already felt amongst the rest of the people who didn't, who had no idea, right? Because right. there was no communication systems. There wasn't Instagram. There wasn't all these things right. that, you know, media news that sort of feeds us all this sort of, you know, at whim, all this information traveled much more slowly. And so they were able to, I think, just leverage the knowledge that they had at the time to, to their benefit, and much in the same way that Columbus was able to do with the lunar eclipse in 1504. Interesting contrast. So, very interesting contrast. I loved it. It was very fun. Made for a great story as part of this podcast. <laughs> Let's jump ahead again. We're going to jump up ahead about 100 years. So we're going to go to the 1919 solar mm. eclipse. This is also known as the Eddington exper experiment. Okay. The Edd Eddington experiment was an observational test of general relativity organized by the British astronomers Frank astronomers Frank Watson Dyson and Arthur Stanley Eddington in 1919. These observations were of the total solar eclipse on May 29th, 1919 and were carried out by two expeditions, one to the West African island of Prince Principe, and the other in the Brazilian town of Sobral. The aim of the expedition was to measure the gravitational deflection of starlight passing near the sun. Huh. And so the value, and this is sort of where we get to sort of, this isn't quite as fun of a story, but it's, it's still an important <laughs> sort of deflection point, particularly as it relates to physics. The value of this deflection has had been predicted by Albert Einstein in 1911, 
Um, however, the initial prediction turned out to not be correct because it was based on an incomplete theory of general relativity. Now, of course, Einstein is very famous for his theories around relativity and, and a lot of just physics in general. And so Einstein later improved his prediction and finalized this theory in 1915 after and, and obtained the solution to his equations. Um, and so following the return of these ex expeditions, the results were presented by Eddington to the Royal Society of London and were accepted. And so this is sort of a foundational, this was a foundational solar eclipse that, or a foundational experiment around a solar eclipse that sort of proved some of Albert Einstein's early theories around general relativity Interesting. or disproved some, but allowed right. others to sort of come up through, which would then lead on to other papers and sort of other scientific theories to, you know, evolve and advance and eventually become things that we actively use today. And certainly around astrophysics. Again, not as fun of a story, but still very, it's very uh, important. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in the world of physics, this is, I'm sure, a pretty big deal, I'm thinking. Uh, yeah, I would say so probably. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I'm not a physicist myself, but I would assume that phys, uh, physicists are probably like, Oh yeah, that was, that was yeah. a huge deal. We for talk us. about that. Yeah. <laughs> we talked about that. Yeah. And then let's jump to sort of the last sort of story, which I do think is another fun story. And I, this is more of a, I, I would almost classify this as almost like a tall tale kind of story. Okay. Um, I'm sure some of it's true. It's much more recent. It just seems a little like people are patting it with some some feel goodery a little bit, but it's still fun. <laughs> so, it's so the 1937 solar eclipse. Uh, so, in 1937, World War II was sort of looming over, well, certainly Europe at the time, but starting to you know get bigger than that. There was a remote island in the Pacific that became the most valuable place for researchers to observe the 1937 solar eclipse. Okay, and it was called Canton Island. And it was home to expeditions by both U.S. Navy seamen and a rival British team. And apparently the U.S. Navy seamen were accompanied by national, a National Geographic team the, of the magazine fame. Wow. This is where I'm getting a lot of my information around this from right. this National Geographic magazine article on this. And apparently both captains of both parties briefly shot at each other. They were military. They were saying that this was our area to, you know, conduct this experiment and, you know, what have you, before ultimately being advised by both of their other respective militaries and countries to settle settle down. This is not the time right. or place for any right. of all this. Where it's supposed to be <laughs> on the experiment. same side soon. Yeah. It's supposed to be on the same side. You know, it, it's an experiment. It's, you know, go look at this, the solar eclipse. You know, it's fine. You can see <laughs> like, how vicious just, science really gets, though, for this example. <laughs> um Eventually, the the Americans and the British uh, entered into a friendlier competition mm. as they vied for the best vantage point from which to view the uh, June 8th, 1937 eclipse and gather data. And the rest of the expedition apparently went without a hitch. So it was, again, it was fine. There wasn't, you know, it wasn't like, there was a lot of space for both of them. I don't know what they were <laughs> originally There was doing. no more shooting. Yeah. And this is kind of where the, you know, how, how much this actually ties into it, it remains to be seen. But this, this is sort of the tie, the National Geographic and some other sources I was using. It's like, oh, this is actually really interesting. Uh, apparently, a few years later, during World War II, the two countries teamed up to use the island as a shared refueling base due to its proximity to Japan, sort of illustrating that, you know, perhaps this friendly competition sort of nurtured that feel goodery, you know, whatever. And led to ultimately them saying, yes, we've already sort of established a relationship on this island. We can continue to use it for both of our aims in this war. I don't know what, I don't know if the solar eclipse or this little competition had anything to actually do with that. Um, but that's the, that's the tie that some people are trying right, to make. It's not quite the uh, two armies throwing down their, uh, their weapons or anything that no. we heard about earlier. But, you know, it's a good story. It's it's a good story. Again, it, it it's got some feel goodery attached to it. I think it's a little bit of a tall tale. I don't know exactly you know how much any of it actually impacted whether at that point during World War II, especially during the point when there was you know they were actively trying to attack Japan. Um, both these countries were well sort of you know allies at this point. Right. Had been fighting for years across Europe and now into Japan. I can't imagine. You know, the United States had it owned the island saying, no, this is our refueling base. You can't use any part of it. And then somebody coming up and being like, but wait, in 1937, we had a <laughs> shared solar experience, solar eclipse experience, and we're buddies now. You know, it just, 
to me, like the the two events don't quite seem to <laughs> right. line up. It, it seems like there's something missing from the story, but we, <laughs> maybe we'll never know, or maybe somebody knows. Somebody might. Maybe know. somebody knows, but yeah. it wasn't in either of the two articles I read about it. I just thought it was <laughs> it was a funny little story. So let's those are those are sort of my modern stories. At this point, we're going to go ahead and jump to 2017. Oh, great, we're going to talk about about the 2017 solar eclipse. Uh, before. Before we do that, we should do our last ad break, and then we'll come back and, and sort of tie this one up okay. and have a lot of fun with that. We'll be right back. And we're back. We're talking about uh, the geography of solar eclipses, or geography is solar eclipses. Uh, we just ran through sort of some modern days ish stories and tales. Now I want to jump ahead to really the 2017 solar eclipse because that was the, there's a lot of reasons for that. That one that was, this solar eclipse was happening at a very specific time in human history where this idea of being able to experience something like that of that magnitude became accessible and desirable for a lot of different reasons. And so let's talk a little bit about sort of the build up to it, what it meant, and then we're going to hit sort of some of the impacts of it that we can now look at now that we're seven years later. And so the solar eclipse of August 21st, 2017 was dubbed the Great American Eclipse by some media, was a total solar eclipse visible within a band that spanned the contiguous United States from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic coastline. And so this really started sort of here in Oregon, was stretched all the way down to, I think, South Carolina. In fact, I might have it here. Maybe? No, I don't. Whatever. So this was a really big deal because this hadn't happened since uh, the February 1979 eclipse. Um, and so this would have been, it'd been quite, there, there had not been a, a total solar eclipse on the U.S. soil since 1979. Now, if you think back to 1979, that's a vastly different world than we are living in that's today. That's right. I was, and I experienced that difference, um, but I was not cognizant of any eclipse uh, or maybe I just don't remember it. Yeah, but uh, it shows just how much right. hype the media has, and, and how easy it exactly. is for people to. I mean, you know, if you have the money um, to travel. I mean, we've done episodes about right. all these modes of transportation and uh, the impact of the media. It's interesting to contrast that with what was happening in '79. Yeah, absolutely. We're gonna we're gonna get to that. We're gonna get to all of that because it's it's a huge part of why solar eclipses have become such a big deal. And so the, the path of totality in 2017 touched 14 states, and the rest of the U.S. had a partial eclipse, including Canada, Mexico, XYZ, including even Hawaii. Hawaii had okay. a little bit of a partial. The area of the path of totality was about 16% of the total area of the United States, with most of the area actually over the ocean and not land. That's probably shouldn't be a surprise. I think most people, especially if you've listened to a lot of the podcast uh, episodes we've done, you're well aware that the ocean is much bigger than all of the land combined. <laughs> Uh, true that. the event's shadow was that that's true <laughs> yep. the event's shadow began to cover land on the Oregon coast as a partial eclipse at 9.05 a.m. Pacific time with the total eclipse beginning there at 10.16 a.m. Pacific time Pacific time the total eclipse land coverage ended along the oh yeah here we go the South Carolina coast at about 2.44 p.m. Eastern time now, if you remember, if you go back to our episode on time zones, you can see sort of the effect of, you can see at least a little bit of the feel of that the, these things are spanning a, a wide range of not just distance, but also times, right? So this would have been not that long of time, right? right? So 10, 16 a.m. Pacific time would have been 1, 16 a.m. or 1, 16 p.m. Pacific time. So it's really only happening over about an hour and a half, this whole, this whole sort of ordeal. These are fleeting events, which is party part, part of their appeal, I suppose, is that they're just they're they're pretty brief, they're pretty quick, um, but you have to be there to witness it. Absolutely, and so of course, and we, we we've already started to hint on this, right? In this day and age of social media, Instagram, the need to experience things that are thought of as rare or or beautiful. Uh, you can kind of see where all of this is going. Yeah, absolutely. Right? This you can is see where the media machine and the tourism industry are thinking. This is a great opportunity. Yeah, they they've got gigantic dollar signs in their eyes. They're sort of running full speed at this. The it's kind of interesting because if we go back and we think about the 1979 solar eclipse, right? The the level of media saturation during that time was a fraction of what it is today. 
I imagine that, I mean, obviously at that point of time, people knew that this was happening. It was probably a big deal in some circles. Certainly if it was happening over your city or town, it was probably a really big deal. Sure. But I imagine that for people that it wasn't, like it was probably like, oh, maybe you hear about it you know, briefly on your news. Oh, you know, this town three states over is going to get, you know, a piece of this eclipse. But you're probably not going to make that big of a deal out of it. You're probably certainly not going to try and take a vacation there because it's so expensive. Right. It's expensive to fly. And the equipment in order to experience it is probably much more rudimentary. Getting things like, you know, social media points, Instagram follows, whatever. These are all things that simply didn't exist in 1979. <laughs> and so the quote unquote payoff for experiencing something like this you know, it's kind of less. And I think that that points to a, a maybe the impact of sort of the uh, dopamine hits that some of the social media sort of generates for us, right? That people want to experience these things, not necessarily to experience it themselves. Of course, there's a lot of people who do want to do that, but also for, you know, the, the idea of having sort of those quote, Instagrammable moments. And this is something that's not just solar eclipse, but happens with a lot of different things. Right. This is content, right? I mean, that's what's going on here. Content. Yeah. I mean, here we are. We're making a whole podcast episode right, all about exactly. We're <laughs> we're part of that whole dynamic. We're part of the machine, and so <clears throat> you can kind of see as we're talking about sort of the desire of people to go and experience this, where this is all going. So, in 2017, cities and towns, especially small towns, were very concerned with the crush of traffic and visitors to regions that would experience the totality of the solar eclipse, and so. If you look on like a map, there's going to be a lot of places that this path of totality is going to hit. But very few of these places are going to be major cities. In fact, it's more often not going to be teeny tiny towns, anywhere between 40, 50 people up to a few thousand people. And these places are not equipped with one roads and infrastructure, planes or hotels or all of this kind of stuff. And so but there's going to be a lot of people who want to come visit them because there'll be, you know, places that are located in areas of totality. Maybe they're close, close ish to a, a major population center that's not in it. And so we kind of saw this in Oregon because Portland, which is a city of about metro area of about 2.5 million people, was not quite in the path of totality. You have to actually travel about 45 minutes south to hit that that path, and and so therefore. A bunch of people from hundreds of thousands of people from Seattle, from Portland, traveled south to these areas along I-5. And then there was just, it was just kind of chaos. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's like apparently, uh, you hear stories about people traveling to Woodstock and the high, and the, you know, the freeway shutting down. And it, exactly. You know, these, these cultural moments where all of a sudden <clears throat> people want to get to a place, as you said, that uh, are don't usually experience a lot of tourism necessarily. Yeah, in Oregon, an estimated one million people were expected to arrive. I'm not, I don't know if we have like a final count on mm -hmm. that. The Oregon National Guard was called in to sort of manage the traffic into and out of these areas, right? Because again, you have a million people flying into various places, driving into various places, maybe taking a train or two here. Uh, and that's just going to cause such an issue for a very small band of area. <laughs> um, apparently, the Madras Municipal Airport, which is a very small town in eastern Oregon, I think it has a few thousand people, received more than 400 mostly private jets uh, that queued for hours while waiting to leave after the eclipse. Now, 400 private jets would be a lot of private jets for almost any right. airport, I mean, regardless Chicago, of the that size. seems like it might even be a lot or something <laughs> yeah. like that. Atlanta. Like it's, I mean, they're also vying with, you know, hundreds of, you know, commercial jets too. But Madras is not a, the airport's not a big airport. It's very small. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and I've, so I've having that Madras amount, and it's not, I mean, it's, yeah. a, it's a very nice place, but it's not a metropolis. Exactly. Yeah. There's a, a man named Michael Zeiler who's an eclipse cartographer. Hmm. So he has like a whole thing where he maps out sort of where eclipses are. It's kind of some kind of cool maps there. He had estimated that between 1.85 million and 7.4 million people would travel to the path of the eclipse within the country at large. Um, I think based on the Oregon estimates, that's probably 
it's probably more on the high end. Um, can, you can imagine, you know, in Texas and you know, the Carolinas, a lot of people, again, tra- trying to travel into that path of totality. This kind of stuff happened over and over and over again, all across the country, illustrating sort of unique travel and transportation and hospitality impacts of such an event. So there was, you know, towns sort of fighting with, you know, people who would, you know, come into their town and start setting up camps basically anywhere and everywhere. And people being like, what are you doing? That's my property. You can't right. set up your camp here. And so, <laughs> unless you pay me, you know, yeah. and like little, yeah. Well, even then, like, you know, a lot of people didn't want this. No, right? it's not like, cause you know, <laughs> people have to use the bathroom and stuff like that. And so uh, you might not that, want that. That was a big concern. Yeah. 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 It's like, there's going to eventually be a mess that's going to need to be cleaned that's, up as well. And I think right. a lot of places ended up having to deal with at least some aspects of this. I don't know how widespread it was, but this is sort of one of the, this is the, the a, a solar eclipse is a kind of like a music festival, right? It's, it's going to happen right. over a very short period of time in a very finite amount of space. And they're, and because it's so desirable and the media has hyped it up so much, it's going to inevitably sort of see that crush of, of people who want to experience it. And yeah. we know from for that, people oh, well, who I was just going to say, we, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I was just going to say, we know from, from events like music festivals that, that there's always an environmental and, and there's just a big cost that comes with these kinds of things. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have the eclipse experience to draw from, but like you, I have the music festival experience to draw from. And, you know, when it ends, you're like, wow, I can't believe it's over. Um, that was mm-hmm. really great. How do we get out of here? You know, how, how are we going to get out of here? <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah. I had friends who in 2017, they had gone down from Portland and they biked, they biked down there. It's, okay. it was, it was kind of a long bike ride, a few hours. But they were like, yeah, it was it was just madness on every any and all roads that were heading south from Portland into the path of totality was just back to like car to car, 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 just for as long as you could see. Um, and that's that's kind of wild to think about. I mean, if there's an alien so this, inv- invasion or something, we we could be in a little bit of yeah. trouble, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think so. Yes. So this kind of brings us up to the subject of today's episode. The reason why we're making a whole episode about it, and that is the 2024 solar eclipse that at the time of this recording is four days away, but as you're listening to it will be yesterday, or at least, you know, if if you're listening on launch day, otherwise it'll be, you know, however many days away from April 8th that you are. I don't know. (laughs) Uh, So on April 8th, 2024, a solar eclipse will be and or was visible across North America. And that's dubbed now the great North American eclipse because everything needs to have a, um, a title, a catchy phrase to tie tied to it, whether it's a storm or an astronomic event. No apocalypse <laughs> type title. Yeah. Right. This eclipse will be the first total solar eclipse to be visible in the provinces of Canada since February 26, 1979, same 1979 okay. solar eclipse we had. The first in Mexico since July 11th, 1991, and obviously the first since 2017 here in the United States. It will be the only total solar eclipse in the 21st century where totality will be visible in Mexico, the United States, and Canada. It will also be the last total solar eclipse visible in the contiguous United States until August 23rd, 2044. So it's the last one for 20 years. So. You can kind of understand why now that there's a large sort of impetus for people to go and view this and see this. In fact, uh, this was sort of the, if if you're watching this on YouTube, you're going to have this sitting in front of you, but let me share my screen here. Oh, wow. So you have, you have in front of you, Hunter, a map of Airbnb listings across the United States. Okay. And again, listener, if you're watching this on YouTube, you're going to have this in front of you. If, If you're just listening, then I'm, I'm going to describe it as best as possible. But on this map shows a sort of occupancy rate from around 10% to 100%. Okay. And this sort of goes from colors of, you know, dark purple for 10% up to bright orange for 100%. And there is a very noticeable band <laughs> stretching from the very far south in Texas up through basically, you know, up into Canada. It would eventually go into Canada, but basically the northern states, New York, upstate New York, Ohio, what have you, that is just 
bright orange. <laughs> and this is showcasing the, I think, the desire in a very sort of real way, the desire for people to go and experience this, you know, event that's not going to happen again in 20 years. What it's a kind great of, cartographic moment this is, right? That somebody a, thought of this. Is, is I know, right? Clever. Yeah. It's, it's very cool. I really appreciate that somebody pulled this together. I don't, I don't know exactly who I'll, of course I'll credit them in, in the, the show notes here. Um, it says air DNA on the thing. I'm not sure who that is. It could just be a map that's showing sort of any sort of given listing at any given moment for Airbnb listings. I don't know. Right. And this is just critical map readers. We had step back a little bit, but, um, this clearly seems to be the path of totality, right? Is that what's happening here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is absolutely the path of totality. Yes. Yes. And like I said earlier, it's, it crosses through a lot of major cities this time. It crosses through, in the US, United States, it crosses through sort of the San Antonio, Austin, and then Dallas in, in Texas. It crosses through, I think, Cleveland and Buffalo and New York. And then it crosses through Montreal in, in Canada. So there's a lot of major cities that are going to feel the... Well, for them, it'll probably be more of an economic benefit. In fact, I have friends who are flying here from from, from here in Portland to Dallas this this week. And in fact, they might be leaving now <laughs> <laughs> because you kind of have to. This is also it's a, it's also very interesting. A lot of these places. Um, this, so this is a one a one night event or one day event, right? You sort of experience it over a single very finite time period. Right. But I know a lot of Airbnbs are requiring like three and four day stays. Right. They're like, this is our chance. <laughs> it's our chance. Yeah. Well, this might be a good time to book your Airbnb or wherever you want to stay for 2044. I mean, I, it's a little in advance, but these things fill up fast. So, um, you know, that is true. Nearly fact, 20 years away. Yeah. Let's see. We're, we're, let's, let's, well, we're, we're in the moment here. So let's, 2044 solar eclipse. I'm going to, I'm going to look up the path right now. Okay. Just to see where it's going to be. Cause maybe it'll be interesting. Maybe it'll be someplace. It will actually be very interesting. It's not going to go through very much of the United States. Okay. It will start in Northern and well, I guess, yeah, I'll say Northern and Eastern Montana and maybe a little bit of North Dakota. Okay. And then it's going to do a wide swing arc, basically following the Rocky Mountains up into Canada mm -hmm. and then up into sort of the Northern Territories. So the, it looks like the two major cities that will, the only two major cities that will sort of get hit by this, this path of totality will be Edmonton and Calgary and Alberta. Everybody okay. else won't get it. So that'll be interesting to sort of see how Plan people ahead. experience that because there's not, if you're not familiar with Eastern and Northern Montana, there's not a whole lot going on up there. Certainly people can go to Edmonton and, and Calgary, but from a tourist, that will be very interesting. Yeah, to see. yeah. Yeah. That'll be very, very interesting to see. Uh, again, if you're watching this on YouTube, I'll have this map uh, thrown in front of you so you can see it yourself. But aside from that, I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe at that point, everybody will have sort of virtual goggles and they can be there virtually. I don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just yeah, an idea. Who knows what the technology <laughs> will lead us to. Um, but certainly this will give this episode legs considering that we're already preparing people for 2044. There you go. There you go. Come back, listen in 2044 <laughs> after you listen to it for the first time. Uh, Hunter, That's run right. us through your, your pluggables. <laughs> I'm Hunter Shobi. I'm a professor of geography at Portland State University. I'm co-author along with David Bannis of Portlandist, a cultural atlas, and Upper Left Cities, a cultural atlas of San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle, and co-host of this podcast, Geography is Everything. Yeah, and my name is Jeff Gibson. I'm the co-host of Geography is Everything, this podcast you're listening to right now. You can also find me over on YouTube. That's youtube.com slash little at sign geography by Jeff. If you want to watch videos about geography, those are always really fun. If you want more geography by us, or if you just want to listen to this and get this podcast sort of sent to your email box, go join us over on Subsec. That's geography is everything .com. And then of course, I always like to ask, but if you enjoyed today's episode, you thought it was fun, you enjoyed learning about solar eclipses and geography sort of tied to them, go over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever app you use to listen. Or if you're watching on YouTube, please leave us a review or like and subscribe to us. It really helps us out and we really appreciate those. Next week, so I guess quick caveats. Last week, we were supposed to do the U.S. Postal Service right. episode, and unfortunately, I got sick. Still feeling a little bit, unfortunately, and well, I just wasn't able to pull it together. Yeah, time. that's In fact, recording would have been, yeah, it would have been really challenging. So that episode has been pushed off to a later date. It will be still a really fun episode. I'm really excited by it. 
but it's just not going to come quite yet because next week, Hunter, we have a really interesting episode that I think, well, I think it's just going to be really interesting. What, yeah. what is it? What are we going to well, be doing? So today we talked about the sun in part, right? Which is a star. We're talking about another star uh, in a week and that's Taylor Swift. Yeah. Taylor Swift. Yeah, geography, geography is Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. Yeah. <laughs> That will be fascinating because one, she has a brand new album coming out. That's right. Two, she has a geography attached to her that I don't think people really talk about, mostly because there's so much more other people talk about. But we're a geography podcast and we can talk about her in in a geographic lens. That's the (laughs) angle we're going for here. And so uh, stay tuned for the various geographies of Taylor Swift. There was a very funny, just before we head out, there was a very funny meme I saw the other day, which was, it was an image of a jet, a private jet that sort of had crashed into sort of a kitchen area. And sort of, you sort of see that thing. I'm not sure how real or fake this image was. Right. It could have been AI generated. Uh, <laughs> but the tagline was, said something to the effect of like, oh, Taylor Swift wanted to get a drink of water in the middle of the night or something like that. <laughs> it's sort of <laughs> illustrating that she sort of takes a private jet everywhere she goes, <laughs> which I think is, is a, a funny little criticism of her. <laughs> well, there's, you know, there is a lot of criticism, but um, there's of a course. lot of, there's a lot of love out there too. So we'll, absolutely, and we'll be focusing in on the geography as best we can, um, talking about music. Um, so I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. Great. Looking forward to it. Come back next week. We're going to do all about geography is Taylor Swift. And I guess until then, we'll, I guess we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. 